you know, we weren't really part of the group. We were, we were also Carol and Debbie, you know, no one, I hate to say it, but I'm not, you know, yes, everybody had, you know, the spouses and all that kind of stuff, but we were this, like this unit, you know, we just, we got in the car and we went and we were just, every minute was together. So I, you know, I hope we didn't miss too much, but I, I don't, you know, on the other side of the, that coin is we probably didn't miss anything because we were together. Puppeteers Podcast presents Cheers to Puppeteers, a special fundraiser to benefit the direct relief fund for puppet artists, helping puppeteers of America impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. We have 10 very special episodes featuring some of puppetry's brightest stars. You can support this effort by unlocking episodes early, purchasing Cheers to Puppeteers swag, or making a donation to the direct relief fund all at puppeteers.com slash cheers. Let's lend a hand and say cheers to puppeteers. We now return to your previously scheduled podcast. Welcome back to Puppeteers. We're your hosts, Adam Krutinger and Cameron Garrity. And today we're talking to Deb Spinney. Welcome to the show, Deb. Thank you for having me. This is going to be fun. <laughs> oh, yes, it is. It is so good to have you here. Um, for anyone who may not know, and I don't think that's too many of you, uh, Deb Spinney is the uh, the wife of the late, great Carol Spinney, uh, who, of course, performed Big Bird and Oscar on Sesame Street for 50 seasons. Uh, she was his manager uh, and just all around friend and and uh, you know, Wrangler and so much. Uh, she also worked at Sesame Workshop for a while back when it was CTW. Uh, and now I get to say words that I never thought I'd be able to say. Deb Spinney, welcome to Puppet Tears. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, we're so excited to have you on and to talk to you. And uh, part of what sparked the interest for that is we just saw you on uh, a Comic-Con recently. What, what brought that on? That was a uh, quite a unique experience for me personally, of course, because um, for years now, Carol and I have gone to comic cons and he was always, uh, you know, a big hit if I must say so myself. Um, but he, he really enjoyed doing them because it's one of the rare places you get to meet really your, your true fans because when you're a puppeteer, you're hidden. You don't see these people around you at all. If you're even, you know, off a TV screen, if you're somewhere, you're, you're really not seeing anybody. You're you're, uh, you know, you're, you're somebody else. <laughs> so he liked doing that and um, it got us to travel a little bit and stuff. And we met these wonderful fellows, uh, Tim Bendig and James Mullen. And Tim is the president and owner of this uh, company called In-Person Productions. And that's his thing. He's an agent for Comic-Con. So all of a sudden we found ourselves doing a lot of them. And, you know, occasionally people would say, oh, Deb, can I have your autograph too? And I'd be like, nah, <laughs> really? <laughs> Carol go, go ahead, sign, sign, sign. So, uh, you know, I did a panel here and there and um, kind of got a taste for it. And, and I know it made Carol very, very happy. And it sort of came up that, um, you know, being Mrs. Big Bird, maybe people still want to ask me questions and stuff. So that's sort of where it came out of. And of course, with COVID, we had to do it virtual. So um, maybe when when that's, this is all behind us, this pandemic, Maybe I'll actually get to go and do it and meet the fans in person. That's so wonderful. No, I was so excited to see you on that. I know, from what I understand, though, the, uh, the Comic Con scene obviously it's been around for a long time, but it was uh, relatively new for for you and Carol um, just for the last few years, I think. Or is that correct? Uh, well, we did we did a couple a while ago, um, like Chiller Theater in Parsippany, New Jersey. That's a crazy one on Halloween. You, can't believe what you're seeing but uh so we did do a few of those um and then you know here and there we would do it but carol was really so busy with sesame street that we we didn't have the time to just say oh let's go for a weekend to st louis or something and do a comic con so it was more uh more recently be, uh, because carol wasn't really performing so much on the street um even if he was doing voices he didn't have to you know be there so much so we had the time and so that kind of started to fill in the gaps with you know, what are we going to do? Let's, let's, let's figure out something else to do. That's so. true. That's true. Yeah. Looking back now that I think about it, most of the times I've gone to comic con, it's people who are, are kind of like, like the power Rangers from the nineties and stuff, yes. right? People that are not, less currently working on yeah. stuff. Sometimes they're still there, of course, but, yeah. um, but yeah, no, I see that's right. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> 
And yeah. it must have been such a wonderful experience for for both of you to be able to meet the fans in person. Um, Cause I know, you know, Carol famously received and, and responded to so much fan mail, but to actually, uh, you know, meet face to face just had to be a really wonderful thing, uh, especially as, you know, he then uh, retired and, and just being able to, you know, continue to, to kind of be an ambassador to Sesame street. Yeah. I think that he always took that role very uh, seriously being an ambassador to Sesame street and, you know, I think at the Comic Cons, it was it was kind of an, an amazing thing because he would have long lines of people and mostly grown ups. Now, you know, more than than children, uh, because when children would come up, he would just be, you know, in seventh heaven. He'd usually come over and play puppets and stuff like that. But um, they all just wanted to hear a story from him because he's such a great story storyteller. And, uh, you know, nine times out of 10, whoever that adult would be, would be standing there and they'd be crying and tears of joy because it would be, you don't know what you meant to me as a kid. You know, you still, it's still in there. I still feel that. And, you know, Carol would be crying. I'd be, <laughs> we'd all be crying, but you know, happy, happy tears. Cause it was just so meaningful to know that you, you actually had an impact on these people's lives and still do. So I think it was really good for Carol to, um, you know, maybe, maybe have a little bit of that to feed his ego because you know you, it's Big Bird and Oscar who's famous and Carol is happy to be just Carol but it's kind of nice to have somebody come and see you you know not wanting to see the puppet but wanting to see the man you know yeah just well and and to see the man's wife I would suspect <laughs> uh, I mean truly because uh especially you know the fans who are in the know uh you know have this understanding that you were so integral to uh to to carol's life and to you know what we were able to to love about big bird and oscar uh well, really... <laughs> we do like I, th I think we did kind of think of ourselves as as one you know it, it was i was blessed to be able to um travel with carol wherever he went you know with big bird and oscar and that actually came about because of jim and jane uh in the early days you know i would stay home because it, Frankly, we just couldn't afford to take me on a trip where, you know, he's going wherever Sesame Street was was doing their shows. And um, it was Jane. We went to Paris once and Jim it was a bunch. I guess it was Ernie Burt and I forget one, a couple of other puppets with Big Bird. But the, the main guys, you know, Jim, uh, Jerry and Richard could not go or Frank either. And so they sent uh, Carol could go. But I. I they sent Jane to do Jim's characters. And I honestly don't, re oh, Richard Hunt did get to go because I just thought, I just had an image of him crossing the street. Um, but we went over to Paris and nobody, there was no publicity. And we were there with this, the greatest singer in Paris at the time. Her name was, I don't know if I say it right, but it's Muriel Mathieu. And she was very, very sweet. And we did this big, lovely show. And then the, the guys looped the voices later on but nobody knew we were there there was no not you know there was no publicity so i somehow i have no idea with my high school french which is really pretty bad um i got the newspapers on the line and i said the muppets are here you have to you know cover this and it did it hit all the papers and jane saw that and of course she also saw how carol really was much happier with me standing by his side and you know fussing over him. And she said, uh, I'm going to talk to Jim, but I think that you should have, she said to Carol without me there, actually, she said, I'm going to ask you something. And I'm going to, you know, some people might not want their wife on every trip with them. But um, so I'm asking you this, uh, would you like Debbie to go with you wherever you go? And he was like, yes, definitely. <laughs> so Jane went to Jim and Jim came to us and he said, from now on, Debbie will be with you wherever you go. And wow. that was like, that was a great gift. So Oh, absolutely. That is, that is so special. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and I, oh I think God. at times you're even credited in different productions as uh, along with Kermit Love for Big Bird. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, get, I get so thrilled when that happens. The first time <laughs> that I can think of was when we were making Follow That Bird, and which was one of our highlights of our life. I think that was such a fantastic movie and experience. We did it mostly in Toronto. And um Ken Quapis was the director. We had never worked with him before. He was the sweetest guy. And he was the only director who's ever said to me at, at the, sh the beginning of each shoot, come sit next to me because you know what Carol would like 
or, or would need. And I want your advice on everything. So he had me sit with him. A lot of times he knew exactly, of course, what to do, but I could put my two cents in if I felt it was needed. And um, so at the end, when we were, we were at the premiere of the movie and, and I'm watching the credits go by and all of a sudden it says special assistant, Debbie Spinney. I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I made it, you know? So that started wow. that kind of thing, I think. That's amazing. Oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, this is all all really great. And, you know, we'll we'll definitely return back to, to some of these things. But we we do like to find out a little bit about our guests and sort of what their their upbringing was. And we'd love to just hear sort of a little bit about you and uh, where you grew up and sort of how you found your way to Sesame Street. OK, all about me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, like, I was born in Brooklyn. And uh, my father was in the army. It was during the Korean War. And my mom, uh, they got married. And then I was born like a year later, uh, a little less than a year, actually. Um, and uh, we moved from Brooklyn after I was three years old. They had my, I was the oldest, then my sister Claudia. And then they moved out to Long Island. And that's really where we were raised. Um, and my father was a musician, Gene Gilroy. He was kind of a... Um, he was very popular in Long Island in Brooklyn, had his own band, and he taught every kid in our entire neighborhood, which was New Hyde Park, out on the island, uh, taught everybody piano, and at the time, accordion. It turned into, uh, he, he lost his accordion um, clients when the Beatles came out, and all the people who played accordion wanted to play guitar. So he, was, <laughs> he loved the Beatles, but he missed, the, he missed teaching the accordion, but he was a fantastic piano player. That's what he did from the time he was a little boy. So that was what he made a living as, uh, a piano man. And my mom sang beautifully. So they were a good team. Uh, but anyway, so six kids came out of this marriage uh, out there in New Hyde Park. And um, let's see, I, I guess I went to get a job. Uh, and I wanted to work in the city. And I just, I've always been infatuated with uh, Manhattan. And so I went to a, tra uh, not a travel agency, an uh, employment agency and said, you know, I'm, I've got, I was a secretary skills, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, and I was 20 years old. And so they said, well, we have two um, positions open. One is an assistant to a manager in the Playtex bra company. <laughs> and the other one is a secretary at a place called the Children's Television Workshop. So, and it was a freezing cold day in January. I think it was zero degrees with a wind chill and me and my little tiny mini skirt and, you know, trying to get around Manhattan. I didn't, I didn't have any money to take a cab. So I walked everywhere. I was, I was a popsicle, but um, I went and I tried for the Playtex bra company job and they said they would give it to me. And then I said, well, I'll let you know. And then I went over to uh, CTW um, right across from Lincoln Center and of course Sesame Street. So um, it, it frankly, it wasn't as good of a job because the other was kind of an assistant to a manager and it didn't pay as much, but there was no doubt in my mind as soon as I walked in there, it's like, I this is where I belong. And, wow. and so I just, I went to Sesame Street. And, and what year was this? This was 1971. Wow, so wow. really early on. Really early too. days, yeah. Oh my it, gosh. It was, it was very early days, actually. They were still yeah. figuring it out themselves. It was really. a second, was gonna, yeah. the start of, start of the second year, would that have been, or start of uh, the third? The third year, I think. Okay. Yeah, but it was wow. very new, really, really new. So. Wow. And so did you have any connection in terms of like knowing about the show, or was it kind of just like word of mouth and, you know, what you would yeah. see in newspapers and such? Or? Yeah, I mean, other than having seen it on television a little mm -hmm. bit, I mean, I was, you know, I, there weren't any little, little tiny kids around me at that point, so I wasn't thinking of it as something I was going to watch, but I had seen it and I thought it was great. Um, you know, so I, 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 it just, it felt, it felt just right. I mean, I, I, it sounds corny to say it feels like you're coming home, but it felt like that, you know, oh, it was so yeah. welcoming and, and the people were wonderful. And of course, you know, 
big bird works there for people. Oh. <laughs> well, and especially too with your family having this this performing arts background. Yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, to be able to be a part of that must have also like you said, it it feels like coming home. Yeah, I maybe that has a, a you know, a, a bit to do with why it just felt like a natural fit kind of thing. And you know, it's music and it's just performing and all that kind of stuff and that's what I grew up with. So and you know, all six kids have their own special talent and they're, you know, they're they they're our best friends. They've always been our best friends. So I can't say enough about them, but um, you know, they're great. And but, you know, it was just, it was just right. Yeah. So when, when you, when you got this position though, you wouldn't have expected to be uh, around production at all though, would you? No, I really didn't. Not, it's certainly not at first. I mean, the only, uh, my, my direct boss, his name was Andy Aguilar. Um, his best friend was Emilio Delgado. So I got to know Emilio very well because he was always hanging out in my boss's office. And so I did get to know him, but, um, and I had my, my eye kind of on, um, I think the first step I would have made into production was going to be working with the children on Sesame Street, you know, cause you always have to have someone there who, uh, you know, helps show them what to do and, you know, just wrangle Someone, them. someone with pain, with uh, patience. <laughs> okay, yeah, yes. <laughs> I had a lot of patience for kids. Yeah. So, um, that was what I thought I was going to do next. Um, but then of course fate stepped in and I, I didn't do that. <laughs> Wow, wow. And started to get involved in the production in a much different way. <laughs> a much different way. <laughs> That's right. Wow. Holy God. How, how old were you when you uh, were hired there then? So I was 20. 20. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Wow. Holy yeah. cow. That's amazing. Yeah. And so, of course, you know, the, the sort of fateful meeting we're talking about, of course, is you meeting Carol. And he really famously has told the story of, of how he met you. But I wonder if you have any personal insights into that story that we've maybe not heard the, uh, your yeah. side of. <laughs> yes, because oh. everybody knows the story of that. <laughs> I'm asking I got to say, though, it's that. like the first time I heard that story, I was, uh, what a beautiful story that is about <laughs> about that. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I, lo I love that story myself. It's just and he always was amazed that being that he's an artist and he's such a grand artist, he always thought, you know, I'm such an observant person. How could I not know that you yeah. were the same girl three times? Yeah. I, always, <laughs> I think it was because I was out of context. I, you know, yeah. being in the office once and then months and months later being in a restaurant and then months later in a recording studio. It, it, had I been sitting at the desk all three yeah. times, I think he would have known. Yeah, of course, but I was yeah. just, you know, this other yeah. girl. So yeah. so and just cute. for context for people who, who the few people who probably don't know it, he had asked you out three different times in those three different places. And yes. then at the one time you finally said yes. And then and then um, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, it came to he figured out, uh, you know, you did a toast to him. Right. Saying that, like, yeah, yeah. We, go ahead. Uh, I, well, we, yeah. <laughs> of course, I'm thinking all along he knows exactly. Yeah. Uh, but I, I raised a glass to him and I said I wanted to. Uh, toast you I want to I want to um, toast you for your persistence and he's you know he really was like what does that mean and I said you know you you your persistence you you never gave up on me and he says I still don't really know what you're talking about <laughs> and then I said well you know you asked me out at the office and then at the Christmas party in the recording studio and and you never you, you never stopped you, you always came back and he just really looked so dumbfounded and he just said you mean you were all those girls? And <laughs> I just like, what? Oh my gosh. <laughs> so crazy. Yeah. And, and what made you not want to just call it quits there? Like, you're not even. <laughs> what do you mean you didn't recognize me all those times? <laughs> no. Well, I had to think that since I was the only girl he ever asked out at CTW, Fair uh, enough. He, 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 I mean, I just had to be meant to be, you know? Yeah. It was, uh, no, it's so yeah. true. Yeah. I, I was just, That's I was so thrilled. <laughs> And when, when was that? Uh, how long were you working at Sesame Street by that point? Uh, you know, uh, and I'm just something coming popping in my head. I think I was actually 21 when I started working for mm. Sesame Street. Yes, I was 21, not 20. Um, and I, when, when the last time that <laughs> Carol asked me out, um, I was 22 and a half. So that's when we really kind of got together. Wow! Holy cow! Yeah, that's just amazing. <laughs> So then, what 
in in that through that courtship and you guys it didn't take you too long to to end up getting married what were the first times that you were able to uh visit the set or to to be with him in performance that would eventually lead Jane and Jim to say like hey you should you should be around all the time uh <laughs> well um of course right from the very beginning I wanted to go do the set with him because that's like, you know, well, you're going to Sesame Street, which is a, you know, crazy even to even think. And Carol would always ride his bicycle to work every day. It was 14 blocks up Broadway. And um, so I would sit on the little, you know, bar or handlebars and we'd drive up to work and, uh, you know, met all the players and, and everybody else. And I knew a bunch of the background people because from CTW. Um, so it just kind of, you know, I just, I went there as often as I could, and it was just so much fun. How could you not want to be there? Uh, and then I guess I think that it just kind of dawned on certainly, like I said, Jim and Jane and and even producers and people like that, that Carol just was happier when I was there. And, he, and I think it helped his performance because the joy was just, you know, it was just overflowing and it it made a difference, I think. So... Lucky for me, they they said, I think you're good around him. <laughs> was that, uh, how soon was that to when you were kind of officially his manager then? Was that around that same time then, or, or is that much later? I really kind of took over, you know, arranging things that he was going to be doing with the uh, producers and things like that. That was probably more... Um, two years later, maybe, maybe okay, two or wow. three years later. I mean, I was around, but it wasn't really on, the responsibility wasn't on my shoulders. Yeah. Wow, see, what's what's just blowing my mind with a lot of this is, uh, is a lot of these details I did know, but I didn't realize how early on it had started. I thought it was took it took longer to kind of unfold a lot of this stuff, and that's just that's just amazing. Wow, it's just like from the beginning. That, that's just crazy. It just blowing my yeah. mind. Well, and don't forget, Carol, not unlike a lot of the, the performers, and I know this was true of Jim, um, they, the, the, the people who are the creative, the, the most creative people that I've known hate the business side of things. Yeah. They yeah. really do. And so I was good at the business side because that's what I studied to do, you know, to be a, in my mind, being a really good secretary to somebody is it's like being a, your work wife, you're taking care right. of everything, you know, right. and you're arranging everything. So, so it came naturally for me to say, look, you don't have to hassle with this. I can do it for you. And so he was happy go lucky over that because you know he didn't even like writing, pay the bills with the you know writing the checkbook. So I took that over, and once I once I started you know taking care of the household, then it just became natural that I would take care of the whole thing. Oh my god, that's that's a the scary thing. Is it sounds kind of like me and Cameron's relationship. <laughs> I was gonna say <laughs> that's why I keep him I'm around. Definitely his work wife. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> oh jeez, no, that's that's oh wow, yeah. But uh, so something that I'm I'm thinking about is that as you're you know going uh, in to to set and watching Carol work and 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 perform these characters, uh, it, as as you're you know in the early years of of your relationship, what kind of insight did that? A further insight did seeing him put those portray those characters kind of give you into who he was as a as a person because uh, it's you know it's now seeing this other facet of his personality had to be yeah. really insightful that's an interesting question um i mean i th <laughs> i'm trying to think i'm sure there were you know insights in in that sense uh i just i you know i think that he so associated with Big Bird from his own childhood. And I could see that he took it very seriously what they would write for him. And, you know, there were times when he'd have to say, you know, Big Bird wouldn't say that. He did the same with Oscar. You know, that's not the way Oscar would be. You know, the integrity of the characters was very important. And that's the kind of man he is, was. Um, he, you know, he wasn't uh, someone who would, uh, I was going to say, but I guess you're not allowed to. Um, we'll bleep it. <laughs> yeah. He wasn't someone who, who would say something that wasn't true. You know, I mean, he, he, we had running jokes in the, in the house with if somebody gave him a gift, say, and he didn't like it, you know, maybe I would go, oh, it's lovely. Thank you. You know, put it over there. He'd go, what's this? 
I, this is terrible. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he, he would definitely, he wasn't able to lie. Let's put it that way. He just, well, maybe he wouldn't say anything at all, but he wouldn't do the little white lies that some of us do. Um, so I'm not sure if that's an insight to his character, but I could see that, you know, his, the characters he did perform, he took as seriously as he took his himself, you know, and I thought that was, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I wonder, uh, as, as you're describing this, it was kind of making me think of the way he would uh, butt heads with, with John Stone. Um, I, do you have any thoughts on sort of what that relationship that was, was like? Yeah. Uh, it seemed very difficult. Agree that John, yeah. It, it, we all agree that John Stone was um, amazing. And he's like the, the father of Sesame Street, it, it feels like. Uh, Carol would say that too. Um, and he was a very complicated person, uh, extremely talented. Carol always said that the best projects and the best uh, things that ever came out was the, uh, of Sesame Street was the collaboration between John and Carol. Because he really loved John. And I think John loved Carol. That was the, the, the strange thing about it. I think it was just this side of John that we didn't understand, you know. Yeah. But but you know what, though? And I just want to point out for people, too, because sometimes I think sometimes uh, people uh, try to use uh, negative situations like that as an excuse to to walk away or, or to quit something. And I just mm-hmm. love that it persevered because I know we've said this about me and Cameron before, too. As much as we do get along, we do butt heads a lot, too. But one thing we've realized is even though we're butting heads, uh, a lot of times we always we have always created our best work together. There you go. That's exactly what Carol would say. Yeah. 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 Well put. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned some of the collaborative nature that, you know, you were able to bring to to Sesame. You, you mentioned, of course, Big Bird in China, um, as well as some of the changes that uh, happened on the show. Things like um, having uh, Gordon and Susan adopt Miles and... That's <laughs> <laughs> and also uh, Louise and uh, Maria getting married. Can, yes. can you just talk about uh, like what? Because th- those are such creative ideas, and uh, you know what? Uh, especially since you didn't necessarily have that that writing background, like what what went through your head in terms of making those those ideas kind of come through? Um, well, I think um, I think with the wedding uh, idea of Maria and uh, Louise getting married. Uh, I know that there for a while there, of course, uh, Maria was dating David and then David, you know, disappeared uh, off the show. And um, they, I remember saying to Carol, you know, when I was young and I, you know, the only TV we had to watch was, you know, like Ozzy and Harriet and all those kind of shows. And it seemed to me that you, you dated somebody, you fell in love and you got married. There was no other way around it. That was sort of what only thing I saw. And I said, you know, we need to kind of show that it's okay that she dated David and that, you know, now they're going to date and they're going to fall in love. You're not going to be assumed because you had that first date, you have to marry him. And I just thought that was a good lesson because I had never had that lesson. And so that kind of evolved into, well, the perfect people would be Maria and Luis. And then, you know, you can show how a family comes about and, and that whole thing. And Carol loved the idea and he went in. Uh, and plus, we we were such we were loved Emilio so much we wanted to get him some extra work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay, this is going to be good. So uh, we we so we love this is a good storyline. Um, so he went in and he proposed that to the producers and they at first they said no. We, she dated David. That's that's we'll leave it at that. And then he was like, no, that this is the point, you know. And then it sat around for a little bit and then um, they picked it up and they said yes. Uh, and a few people claimed that it was their idea. <laughs> <laughs> Carol's like, that's not your idea. <laughs> and he always said to me, he goes, we have to write these things down. <laughs> so um, that was that. And then as far as the adoption goes, um, actually, uh, well, I'm sure people know that when I first met Carol, he had three children already, uh, whom I adore. They're my kids, uh, Jesse, Melissa, and Ben. And um, he had adopted Jesse, his first baby. And he absolutely adored the ground she walked on. And he thought, you know, the, that adoption was for him the greatest thing that ever happened. And so I thought, you know, let's, we, nobody talks about that very much, you know? So let's 
figure out. I, I think maybe um, Roscoe's wife might have even been pregnant at the time because it turned out that she that was the baby. Miles became the real baby. Um, but I thought, let's talk about adoption. It's such a special thing to be able to do for not only the people who miraculously get a baby, but for the child, you know, and, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's wonderful. So that kind of came because of our own experience. And so we put that in, you know, into the storyline and that turned out to be a great story as well. So yeah, got myself. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Definitely. Well, I'll write that down either. <laughs> what uh, I just have to ask because I can, I can imagine that you know there's a lot of people involved in 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 the company that may have had ideas and pitched ideas. What if, what about it? Is there anything particularly other than just those being wonderful ideas that maybe helped uh, get it through? You think in any way? Um, I I I don't. Th- I don't know, but I don't think so. I think it was just the right idea, the I right guess, time. at the right time. I, yeah. I, I don't know the answer to that one, really, to tell you the truth. And it is coming from Mrs. Big Bird, so I guess <laughs> yeah. that, that does help. Though. Well, yeah. and of course, Carol would go in and say it yes, for yeah, of course. Well, you know, then it's also coming from Carol, so yeah. that's better. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's amazing. And I, I, I could imagine too, uh, you know, as you guys are, I mean, the, the, the big bird in China seemed like such a treacherous trip at times. You guys also had to be kicking yourself at certain moments of like, why did we think of this? I know. It was a tough one. I think the scariest moment came when, um, uh, Big Bird and um, Xiao Fu and Barkley the dog had to get in this very flat bottomed boat and go down the Li River. And there had been a like monsoon rain just before that. So the river was rising and it was flowing as it, it seemed like you were, they were sailing by at 80 miles an hour. And the fact of the matter is had that anything happened and that had overturned, it would have been the end of all three of them. First of all, Carol couldn't get out of Big Bird. He would drown in Big Bird. Barkley could never get out. He'd be down. And the poor little girl, I mean, it was it was so dangerous. There was a person hiding in the, the little hut too, but that guy was a goner as well if that yeah. thing went over. Yeah. It was or just, he would have had to pick one. It was, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's even worse. <laughs> but it was frightening. It was really, really frightening. And I know Carol was extremely uh, worried that, you know, something would happen mostly to Lian Tzu, uh, Xiao Fu. Yeah. But, yeah, they live to tell about it. <laughs> wow, yeah. <laughs> it's scary. Yeah, to me, you don't the, clear the, that for production insurance these no, days. <laughs> I'm surprised we got away with that one. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing just to look back on all kinds of things and be like, wow, can you believe I did that? Like, what was I thinking? I know. At least it all worked out. Yeah, oh my gosh. <laughs> well, Carol's quite an adventurer. You know, so he, you know, he bungee jumped off of a bridge and he's, you know, slalom water skied and hiked up mountains. And, you know, he's, he's a... He was always a real uh, adventurer is the word because he was, he was up to, to do anything wacky. But that one, I think, scared him, <laughs> mostly because it had other people to be worried about. Right. You know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, did you, uh, would you partake in some of those adventures with him besides <laughs> <laughs> just being uh, around? Um, I don't Videotaping? mind. <laughs> <laughs> I like the cable car going up even better. Yeah. Uh, we, we love taking cable cars up the mountains. We'd go to actually we'd go to the alps uh, almost every summer for a, quite a long time and that was our thing we'd try every cable car go up every mountain have a picnic up at the top um i'll miss that but uh i went and stood on the edge of the bungee bridge with him uh the second time and uh i was we were going to do it in t- tandem and i got there and i was like i think i changed my mind <laughs> <laughs> It's just a little bit too much for me. And I'll hold the camcorder. <laughs> yeah, I, I have plenty of footage. Believe me, that's that's my thing. I'm behind the camera. Um, I've, I had to build an extra little room just to put all the photographs in. But um, yeah, no, I, I like to watch Carol do everything. I'm not doing it myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my awesome. gosh. Um, yeah, you know what? Something else that. I wanted to to ask about because uh, again, Carol, you know, famously uh, made his his big break in in meeting Jim at a Puppeteers of America festival. Um, Adam and I are both 
you know, really involved in the in the P of A. Um, did you get to visit with, uh, you know, would you go with him to, to P of yes. A festivals ever? Was, and what was that? What would that community be like for, for oh, you guys? We, we really love the festivals, especially in the the old days. Um, I, I don't you know, I don't even know how, why to compare them that way. But um, maybe it was because, you know, all the you know, Jim was there and Frank was well, mostly Jim. I, I would say Frank would be there, but mostly, uh, you know, hanging out with all the puppeteers was great. Carol loved the potpourri at night where you would just everybody would say, you know, potpourri at midnight and everybody would bring their puppets and do crazy stuff. Um, I really did enjoy it. And I know Carol enjoyed it. And I think he he kind of stopped enjoying it as much when Big Bird became so famous because in the beginning days, he was just Carol, a puppeteer. Yeah. And it was, you know, it was kind of fun just to be one of the gang. And then it got to be the point where we'd walk into the the, audit, the hallway or the auditorium and you'd see everybody go, there he is, there he is. <laughs> you know, it's Carol Spinney. And once he became kind of famous, he didn't enjoy it as much. It, he wasn't one of the guys, you know, he just yeah. wasn't one of the, the regular old puppeteers. He, he, he preferred it that way uh, as far as the P of A went, but he always supported them. And, uh, and he, would, I don't think he's ever met anybody who said, I want to be a puppeteer who he didn't say, join the puppeteers of America. I mean, that's, that's, you know, kind of a must. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, movies. and he was so involved in helping to to run things at times. I mean, I, I believe he yes. was like directors of festivals. He was, uh, and he hated it. Because <laughs> <laughs> he didn't like to be in charge of people. Yeah. You know, somebody would call him up and, uh, you know, I don't like my room because now you're in charge of not only the shows, but he's running the festival. So making sure that, you know, all the people have the rooms they want and, and you know, this and that. And they'd be yelling at him because they don't like their room or they don't like you know, where their, their slot in the program is. And he's like, I don't really like being the one to tell everybody what to do. That's why he really never sought out being a director. He loved a good director, but he didn't want to be one himself. He wasn't really eager to, you know, tell people do this, do that. That wasn't his nature, really. Um, but back, back to the P of A, he, he, he did, uh, you know, he did think it was a a fabulous organization and he had some great times there and of course the the famous you know story which probably is the ultimate puppeteer uh <laughs> is uh when everything went wrong and jim henson was in the audience and uh carol did the best he could and he went backstage and he's practically in tears puppeteers and jim comes in and says i liked what you were trying to do and the rest is history yeah. so <laughs> No, it's such such a wonderful story, and I, I love in the in the I am Big Bear documentary some of Carol's you know really classic stories that everyone sort of can yes. almost say the words to like it's a song they know um, <laughs> yeah. that they actually got animated and stuff and and memorialized yeah. in that way. We, we were over the moon that uh, Copper Pot Picture fellas wanted to make a documentary. Uh, at first, we were like, "Uh oh, does this mean like we're going to be." like recognized everywhere we go. We didn't want that, you know, we didn't, not that that has happened once in a while we, we got recognized, but you know, that, that wasn't the, uh, the case, which was good because we didn't want that kind of fame. But um, uh, the, the, the fellows who, who put that movie together with a lot of blood, sweat and tears and years and years actually, uh, they really started it as what they thought was gonna be um, a documentary about Carol and Sesame Street. And uh, when they came to us after three years of looking through all my home movies and, uh, you know, photographs and everything in this house and three, you know, carloads full of stuff, they, uh, this is, uh, I should say their names, uh, Dave, Chad and Clay, we love them. Um, so here they are and they said, uh, well, we thought I Am Big Bird was gonna be about Carol and Sesame Street, but we were wrong, it's a love story. And that's what I hear from everybody who watches it. it. It's one of the greatest gifts we've ever been given. Yeah. You know, who, who has a movie about their life for Pete's sake? <laughs> you know, yeah. it's kind of crazy, but it's, it's wonderful. I think it's, it's beautiful. Uh, it it really is, and um, I, I one of the things that I think makes it really special is all those home movies that you guys um, did did record. Uh, yeah. What what was the thinking and first? Um, kind of picking the camera up, especially um, Adam pointed this out. We talked to Richard Germany 
a few weeks ago and, you know, kind of said to him, like, gosh, you know, uh, it's not you picked up a camera at a time where it was not necessarily easy for someone to just, you know, pick up a camera. Um, what what was that impetus for for you and Carol? Um, well, first of all, Carol has been taking home movies since he was a young lad, actually. Um, you know, when he was in the Air Force, he had a camera out there and he was in Vegas and in Germany and he took movies all the time and, you know, wind up camera with the film and the whole thing. So uh, when I met Carol, he had tons of movies, uh, more movies than actual photographs, I guess, but he still had a lot of photographs. So he, he just was a natural photographer himself. For me, my dad was really into photography. He used to develop his own pictures. I have I, I love the baby pictures he has of me because I don't know many people who have such great baby pictures <laughs> back in the early 50s, you know, um, but he was always taking pictures. And, you know, of course, then when the six kids come down the stairs for Christmas and the floodlights are all in your face, it's like, <laughs> yeah, I'd put the lights down. Um, but but thank God he did because we have movies of all of us, you know, it's when we're little. Yeah. So I think I got it from my dad and then I saw Carol do it and then Carol always had the equipment. Then I started to pick it up because I wanted to take pictures of Carol and of course all the Muppety kind of things that are happen, happening. And um, it's just, I, you know, people used to say, would you put the camera down for Pete's sake? Because I just love to, to me, it's like you are capturing a moment. And especially now it's, I get to I get to see us having a picnic in the Alps. You know, I get to see my mom and my dad and Carol and everybody. Or you just you know, it's it's like you can you can go back a little bit and have it again. Not that you know, not that it lasts too long. Once the the film stops rolling, you're like, oh god. But um, I think it's a it's a great gift. It's a really wonderful thing. So I'm glad that it's been in my life ever since I can remember. Yeah, I'm so glad you pointed that out too, because I hear people say that kind of thing a lot too, like, "Oh, put the camera down, like just just live in the moment too." But, but, and I think there's a fine line between those two things. But like, it, looking into the future, like I don't know, I never heard anyone say, "Man, I wish I had less photos of <laughs> of like my family," or "I wish I had less footage." Like nobody says that. Like no, I'd rather I overdo it than than underdo it. And uh, yeah, I, I don't think you'll ever regret doing that. No, I, I don't think so either. I mean, yes, it's different now because, you know, people have 10,000 pictures of their grandchild on yeah. their phone. Um, maybe, you know, we don't need 18 pictures of the dog in his, you know, Santa hat. Yeah. But still, that's if that's what makes you happy, then you should do it. You know, it's yeah. it's uh, it's just you're, you're capturing a moment and it's a, it'll be a memory forever. And I mean, I, I've you know, I've thought about people, what, a hundred years ago or more, maybe, um, you know, if, if you, you know, months or years would go by when your loved one is passed and you have to struggle to remember what they sounded like or even looked like sometimes, you know, we don't have that problem now. You can hear your baby's first words. You can see his first steps. It's, it's amazing. You know, we're, we're really blessed to have the technology Perhaps maybe we, you know, some, I won't say we, cause I'm not too good at it, but with the new stuff, um, maybe, you know, it might be overkill sometimes, but I, I don't know. I, I could never put down taking pictures. Yeah, I know. No, not at all. Definitely. Um, you know, do you, you've mentioned a couple of the places that you've been able to travel. Do you, do any, um, trips stand out to you either just you and Carol or, or, uh, t traveling for Sesame Street as, as some of your places, favorite places that you've been? Um, well, I think one of our very favorite places on earth, and we've been there 18 times, is New Zealand. Oh. And the reason, there's many, there are many, many reasons. Uh, the people are incredible. They're <laughs> the friendliest, most welcoming people you'll ever meet. The country, we've been, we've been there enough and spent usually a month each time we went. So we'd you know, we could do North Island, South Island, everything in between. Um, so we know it pretty well. And we have many uh, friends who have stayed friends there. That's where Carol Bungie jumped. Um, <laughs> but it's just, uh, it's its so diverse. I mean, the South has Alps and the North has 90 mile beaches and, and cowrie trees that are so 
thick you you know you wouldn't fit it in this house practically um the trunk it's just it's magnificent so i would say that you know that probably tops our list for a beautiful place to be um i would say ireland is another one of our very favorites we usually there at this time every year uh so of course this year well this year is different for many reasons but nobody could go anyway because of the pandemic but uh, we love Ireland and we both have Irish roots. So we have a, a real uh, affinity for, for going there. And the people, Carol used to always say, it's like the, the New Zealand of the North. Um, <laughs> it's, it's beautiful and the people are friendly and um, nothing wrong with a nice hot whiskey by a fire. Um, and then uh, trying to think, I mean, of course with Sesame Street, we've gotten, we, you know, we did love being in China. Um, we didn't have to deal with you know, the political side of things. So we just, we got to see the people in the places and that was lovely. And um, we, oh, we love Hawaii or should I say Hawaii? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's one of our favorites. Um, and like I mentioned before, we loved going to the Alps, particularly the German Austrian Alps because uh, that's where, you know, Carol was stationed in Germany. So he kind of fell in love with the architecture and the the clothing and I mean I have a closet full of lederhosen and dirndls that you wouldn't believe <laughs> <laughs> and Carol would wear them all the time so uh and I would too but the, the laces were getting a little snug <laughs> so that's those are so kind of places we, I guess we we really love oh wow. that's, that, that's really so wonderful amazing. you know <laughs> what, one thing that I I'm just curious about too because uh one aspect of Carol that has always been a huge inspiration to me is his artwork as well uh, during the day, I'm an elementary school art teacher, and I actually have done lessons uh, on Carol and his artwork. And actually, I sent him, I wrote him a letter years ago telling him about it, too, with a little portfolio. Yeah. So so my question about him as an artist, especially knowing uh, about your story and how quickly you guys uh, started a relationship, like, at what point did you realize that he was also, like, an amazing artist as well? And, like, and, and how does that fit into everything? Because just, like, creating art is just, like, it's just, I mean, I mean, the puppetry is definitely art, too, but his paintings and drawings like that's another whole side of him that luckily a lot of people are familiar with but i wish more people even knew about it i agree with you that i wish more people knew about it because i think it was a little bit of a frustration for carol to not be known for his artwork because um number one he was he was phenomenal at drawing and painting and he did it all the time. I mean, I literally saw him drawing in his sleep. I should have put a paper up there and a pen in his hand and see what happened, but he would, he, he drew really all the time when he wasn't, puppetry was one side of his creativity, but I think even more so was the, the artwork. And I have hundreds and hundreds of of original drawings and he would always do our Christmas cards, uh, which actually one of the things I wanted to do uh, for him really, and, and maybe just to keep me uh, focused on something is I've uh, submitted all Carol's Christmas cards from the time we met and all those, and sometimes he'd draw me little Christmas drawings and stuff. And I've submitted them all to Sesame Street because I want to have a book published of Carol's Christmas artwork. Oh. And that would be so, so amazing. Yeah, so they're very excited about it. Of course, with the uh, COVID, you know, situation, you, things aren't moving along as quickly as you'd like them to. So, I would love it to come out next Christmas, but it depends on how well things are, you know, situated because of the pandemic. Whether it's next Christmas or the Christmas after, but um, I would love if that. If Barack and Obama could publish a book this year, <laughs> we could definitely make. <laughs> <laughs> the Carol Spinney book <laughs> happened. You know that Barack Obama is Carol's ninth cousin, twice removed. You know, I heard that at one point, and I couldn't remember if it was if that was true or if that was something that I just heard. Oh, and that's true. Had Carol made up. Was so proud of that. Yes, that's true. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yes, uh, hopefully that will happen. I, I know it will happen. Hopefully, it'll happen sooner than later. Um, I would love to also put out uh, an art book of Carol's other art, not Christmas. And of course, a lot of his art have Big Bird and Oscar in them. Yeah. His, his main uh, canvas paintings, the big the big stuff, they they pretty much all have, have the characters in them. He, he loved drawing them more than anything. And he drew them the best too. I 
I'm not, I'm not just saying, but he drew them better than anybody. Um, yes. So, you know, so he, he definitely drew them a lot, but he's got an awful lot of things that are, are not Big Bird and Oscar related. Um, he has a whole portfolio of me, which is really lovely um, and all sorts of other stuff. But he, when he was home here, if he didn't have a chore that he had to do, you know, like a household kind of chore, rake the leaves or whatever, he was drawing, he drew all the time. So I think he, uh, he, he, he just loved to do it. It came naturally to him. When he was six years old, I have a book, a little comic book he made when he was six. It's called Gone the Bad. <laughs> Don't ask me to explain that, no. but um, it's, it's adorable. And he was good. You know, yeah. he, he was yeah. born with this gift. His mom had the gift of, of drawing. She's phenomenal. And uh, Melissa and Ben can both draw incredibly incredibly well so it's it's in the blood that's amazing you know another thing that was just inspiring about i mean not just the fact that he was an artist and his work was amazing but it's also just like it it was like so surreal like the things that he did with these characters in these paintings was so interesting like some of the ones that were i was very drawn to are like the, the i think there's one with um big bird in like an astronaut suit which was like really really fun yeah. and another one you know big bird flying and stuff and i think another one with him in like in leaves under a tree and stuff and they yeah. were just all so beautiful and almost surreal and playful and yeah, yeah. and and like in, in a way you almost wonder like okay i could see this being part of a picture book but even just the piece by itself was a, like a whole story that's just true. just, just that by itself true. He would do all of those paintings that you described. The, the the autumn leaves one, which is wonderful, was based uh, on a picture I took of him playing in the leaves outside of our house. And he loved putting Big Bird or Oscar, but mostly Big Bird, in real situations. Um, the one where he's flying, that one's called In My Dreams I Can Fly. And that one came to him when he was in an airplane flying over Saskatchewan. And it had all the fields down below. And he just said, when I, when I get home or where actually it was Hawaii because um, all of his big paintings were painted in Hawaii uh, oh. each year he would do one and we had a house for 14 years and so for 14 years we came home with a painting a year and uh, the other one that you mentioned um, which one was that? I'm trying the, to the astronaut oh the astronaut that's called Luna Bird yeah. and that's actually a triptych and that is Big Bird on walking on what looks like the moon and then on the side panels one is oscar in a trash can spaceship taking off and then over here uh is uh the the martians you know yep 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 <laughs> and uh and, and it's a it's a fabulous uh painting really so yeah he loved doing it he really really did and of course there you know there are there are more than those, but those are. Um, I'm glad. I'm glad you you know them. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. And it, to be honest, it was it's kind of hard to search for them and find them. Hopefully, after this, it'll be a little easier. But you just said that he loved to do it, and I think you could say that about most artists creating art. But like one little thing that I'm going to point out as like proof that he loved to do it. Like I like I mentioned, I wrote him a letter, and he had written me a letter back. And it, there's a drawing of Big Bird that's inked and, and painted on it, and another one on the back of it too. Like oh, there you go. Like not and only on the he write too, right? And yeah, and the, <laughs> yeah, it's all over. I'm like, he did it th like three times, which is just like you have to love it if you're gonna do that. Not yeah. to mention this beautiful letter that he. That I'm he sent so me happy too. that you have that. That is. Oh, true. absolutely. Yes, it's very. It's, yeah, I love it. Like, I couldn't. I, I was shocked. First of all, to even to even get a, a response, because really, I mean, the letter I, s I sent to him was like a, a thank you, almost like a gift, like thank you for. Your inspiration. I've got a picture of me in a Big Bird costume at one year old, oh. uh, and uh, and you know and and I you know I sent him this letter, not expecting anything back, and I got this beautiful letter with his, you know, and he did these little sketches on it, and I'm just so grateful for it. So I'm so glad he did. He did a lot of fan mail. He really, really did. It was only towards the last years where it became harder, you know, for him to 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 keep up with it really, or to or to manage to do like what you got. That was. That came easy to him and he loved doing it. And yeah. I'm sure he loved your letter, you know? So um, that's great. I'm so happy that you, you, you got not only a letter, but the envelope with the picture on it. Too. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Oh, so beautiful. Um, you know, as something that, uh, and if this isn't something that you'd like to talk about, I completely understand, but um, you know, when, when, Carol ended up retiring in in 2018. 
um, something sort of struck me because I know he struggled with with dystonia, um, and I I've dealt a lot in my family with with chronic illness. Um, I I was chronic. I, I had illness all growing up and through high school and college. Um, my mom also has has struggled, and we've both had to take leave of absences from from work or in my case school. Um, and there was something it, when you were in that situation and, and dealing with those things um, to be able to, you know, not have to worry about about the workload and just focus on on yourself uh, and and your healing. Um, can you describe what it felt like for for you and and Carol to sort of retire and step away from Sesame Street? Because for as as cathartic as that that moment was, I have to imagine in some way there was a bit of a relief of just like, you know, we we get to just you know be Carol and Deb now for a little bit. Um, can can you share any insight into that? Um, yeah, I guess so. Uh, I, it's it's hard, you know, when it, when we first realized that he was going to be retiring, um, it wasn't really that he said, oh, I'm going to retire October 18th, 2018. Um, it was sort of, uh, they knew that that was going to be, um, they were going to be taping a show for the 50th season. And uh, they, he also knew that everybody was uh, really wanting him to be able to, uh, to perform in all 50 seasons, because that was always important to him. So they were, you know, very, very good about uh, making sure that that happened. And he was, he did the voices that day. And then that night they had a big retirement party. And um, it was very bittersweet because Carol always said he never wanted to retire. And frankly, if he had not gotten dystonia, he would still be doing it. You know, he, he had, he was not the guy who was going to give it up. You know, He loved being Big Bird so much. And, you know, I, I kind of, you know, Big Bird is so much a part of him that he just couldn't imagine not doing it. But once he was not feeling as well and he didn't have the energy and things weren't coming as easy anymore. And, you know, once the balance went, which is one of the, the big things that happened with the dystonia that really kind of, you know, that the writing was on the wall when you can't stand up and hold the puppet up because you might fall down, you know, that's just not going to happen. So I think once that kind of happened, I think he did have a little bit of a relief. Like there's a reason why I can stop now, you know, um, and I should stop now because Big Bird's got to be at his best and I can't do that anymore. Um, so I think it was very bittersweet, but like you even said, um, he loved being home. We love our house, our home. Um, Carol bought this land here in 1961, just, just a piece of land, 48 acres for $2,000. He always said, just $40 an acre. Um, and then built the house and we've been, you know, we call it the hodgepodge lodge sometimes because it just goes in all, all these different directions, but it's a wonderful, wonderful place to be. And it's, you know, it's our little, it's our place. Uh, so he was looking forward to not having to drive to New York you know, every other week. And even though the taping season had gotten a lot shorter than it used to be, you know, in the old days we were going down seven months a year, whereas now it was more like two, three months. But he started to really not like the ride. It was uncomfortable for him. And um, he just was like, you know, I don't really care if I go to New York anymore. So, so he was getting away from that whole, you know, feeling anyway of I need to be there. He didn't need to be there anymore. So I, you know, I think he accepted it well because he really, uh, he, he started to, he was drawing all the time. Now that's, I think the saddest part came when uh, about a, about that year, probably, his drawing started to be affected by the dystonia, which we didn't expect. We thought, you know, we knew the left hand wasn't working anymore, but his right hand could do anything he wanted. But the brain, it's, you know, being a neurologic, neurological disorder, um, the brain wasn't giving the signals that are the, the knowledge that's in there to his right hand. So all of a sudden he would try to draw like he could always draw with his eyes closed and it wasn't coming out right. And I would say that's probably, that was more of a disappointment and a frustration for him even than having to give up being Big Bird and Oscar. So that was, you know, that was, that was hard. That was the hard part. But he was the most optimistic person you will ever have met. He never 
complained. He never lamented about, look, only once did he say to me, this is a terrible thing that's happened. And I said, yeah, it is. And then it, he never said anything else again. And one week before the end, he said to me, I think I'm gonna live to be a hundred. I said, really? He goes, yeah, I want to. I said, great, that is, I'm so happy to hear that. So he, and this was when he was, you know, not doing very well, but that wasn't, he wasn't accepting that. It was, I love it here. I love to be with you. I'm not going anywhere. So he, he didn't sit and cry in his beer. Oh, he hated beer. So he wouldn't do that anyway. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> he did. Birdseed yeah. milkshakes, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. um, oh, you know, the last, yeah. You know, it was love till the end. That's beautiful. Yeah, that that is that is so that is that is really beautiful. No, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, one thing I, I was thinking about too, because I, I was uh, in preparation for this, I did rewatch um, "I Am Big Bird" uh, last night, and one thing that uh, stuck out to me more than the first time I saw it was how it was brought up a couple times. I think Frank was mostly talking about it. How sometimes Fred, um, I'm sorry, Carol felt like an outsider, kind of, uh, within the Muppets. And I was just kind of curious of of kind of your perspective on that because you, in a way you kind of you knew a lot of these guys too and whatnot and I'm sure that wasn't from a personal standpoint it was more from a working standpoint I just wonder if you had any more thoughts on that Yeah um, I think that in a sense Carol and we were a little bit on the outside but only because we didn't choose to do it that way. That's just the way it was. We lived 153 miles away. Everybody else was staying in the city. When the, when the job was over for that evening, they could go out to a bar and get a drink or you know meet on the weekend to do whatever. We would get out of town as soon as we could and get home. And we were always home on the weekends and we'd drive back down again. And you, know, you put in a full day of work and in those days particularly, Big Bird was the star. He was in every scene practically. And so Carol wouldn't get home till eight, nine o'clock at night. He was exhausted and he had to then do his homework by cutting and pasting up the script, the origami <laughs> little thing that he did to get it for the next day. So there was no time to socialize. Everybody loved each other. Uh, we, Like I said, we'd go home on the weekends. We did live very far away. Um, so I think, you know, other than, you know, occasionally Jim would give us a call and say, hey, want to come over and we'll, you know, we'll watch something on TV or let's go walk, take a walk in Central Park or go to a movie or get something to eat. He was, he was close enough, uh, you know, in proximity to us. He lived in the Sherry Netherland fabulous place. And so we got to see him once in a while and he wasn't around a lot either. But I would say other than Jim and Jerry, we'd kind of hang out with uh, once in a while. He'd come up to the house with his daughter. Um, Frank even used to come up with and they Carol and he would go um, uh, dirt bike riding together. It was just oh, yeah. funny. Uh, and Richard Hunt. Oh, that's was a picture. Over, <laughs> and, yeah, that's a picture. All right. And Richard Hunt, of course, you know, you had you have to love Richard. Just just thinking about it makes me smile. Um, he was always fun to be around. So we'd we'd see him once in a while. But, you know, we weren't really part of the group. We were we were also Carol and Debbie, yeah, you know, no yeah. one. I hate to say it, but. I'm not, you know, yes, everybody had, you know, the spouses and all that kind of stuff, but we were this, like this unit, you know, we just, we got in the car and we went and we were just, every minute was together. So I, you know, I hope we didn't miss too much, but I, yeah. I don't, you know, on the other side of the, that coin is we probably didn't miss anything because we were together. So. Yeah, no, right. that's, that's, I'm so glad you put it that way. That's beautiful. But, uh, you know, another thing I just have to just point out, just because you mentioned it, you said, uh, you know, just mentioning Richard Hunt's name made you smile. Do you have any uh, stories about Richard Hunt as well? <laughs> <laughs> I have a funny one, Richard and Jerry, because those two were like little, you know, Dickens. Yeah. <laughs> we were, we went to, uh, we went to London to do the Muppet Show. Uh, I think it was the late seventies and Carol was going to be guest starring with uh, Leslie Uggams. And so, so it was uh, Jerry and Richard, particularly Richard, who had this grand, great idea. Let's all go out with, you know, Jim. I don't know if Frank went, I don't know why I don't have that in my mind, but I know Jerry, Richard, Jim, me, Carol, and I think Jane, uh, let's go out to this place called the 1520 club. I've got the date correct. And it was, 
it was this old, old place, you know, cavernous, that was set up exactly like a big medieval hall of in 1520. And you'd, you'd, you know, you'd have to, the people in costume, the whole thing. And you'd sit at these long trestle tables and they'd get the, the, the thing of mead, whatever the heck that was, in the pewter mug and the, you know, plate full of a slab of meat and some gruel or something. <laughs> and it was, you know, a little bit of entertainment. And they had the, the thing in the front of the, the, the group of, of, you know, the, uh, the tables. What is that thing called where you put your head and your hands in? Is, is it a stop? The stop? Oh, I, I, I'm not sure. I know what you're talking about, though. You know, yeah. That, the, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, so they had that thing. And so, <laughs> and now, meanwhile, me, Carol, and Jim are sitting there going, oh, God, this is really awful. Why did we come to this? <laughs> And Jerry and Richard particularly are having a ball. And the thing is, is if you had to go to the bathroom, you had to raise your hand. And then the sire in the front there in his costume would say yes. And you'd have to say, if you were a guy, you'd have to say, sire, may I have permission to point Percy at the porcelain? And if you didn't say that, they'd put you in those stocks things and they'd throw bread at you. And then if you were a girl, you had to say, sire, may I have permission to point Alice at the chalice. And now me, Jim, and Carol are like, do you have to go to the bathroom? I'm like, yeah, I really want to go, but I'm not going. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. And Jim was like, I will die before I will raise my hand and say that I am not going to go. So the three of us are all holding it in the whole time. <laughs> and of course, Richard's up there throwing bread at everybody and all that. And then when we left, you know, Jim goes, don't ever bring me here again. And Richard's going, why? Wasn't it great? It was so much fun. So you know, that's the kind of thing you you got with Richard. He, you know, in New York City, he owned a yellow checker cab and he would drive around with the jump seats and everything. One time he pulled up to our place and he goes, get in. We get in and there's Mark Hamill in the back seat. We're like, what the heck? <laughs> you know, I mean, Richard was just so full of fun and uh, he was he's fabulous. He's like I said, I've seen me smile and he just yeah. makes me smile. Those are amazing stories. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Uh, you know, something else that you said just made me think of uh, one thing, because I, I was rereading um, Carol's autobiography, The, the Wisdom of Big Bird, uh, in preparation. And I, so I probably read that book about 16 years ago when it first came out. Um, and I had forgotten that when Carol was doing the um, Big Bird in front of the orchestra shows, between songs, he would go off stage, change his T-shirt, and have to take oxygen to keep himself going. As as his wife and partner in crime, what was going through your head as he was doing this? Uh, that was those were those were scary. They were wonderful to do because you felt like you were doing something very important. Because children were getting to, you know, they're getting all dressed up and come to see the, you know, the symphony orchestra play for the first time in their lives. So yeah. it was, I think, it was an important thing. But it was scary. Carol would lose three to five pounds every show. He would sweat bullets because he was out under the hot lights. Um, I would sweat bullets because I'm worrying he's going to fall off the stage because you can't really see anything because there's no televised uh there's no cameras so <laughs> you're kind of blind up there and i'm like oh god he's gonna get killed <laughs> but uh so i was a nervous wreck and i'd peel his t-shirt off of him and which is unusual because carol was the least sweaty guy you'd ever know he just didn't sweat frank used to tease him because in the beginning when carol would do a uh, right hand for frank and jim a lot uh in the very beginning days and when Carol would pull his hand out of the right hand and Frank would then need to go in again, or even if he pulled it out of a head that he was do doing a puppet with the guys and Frank would go, did you use this puppet? And Carol would go, yeah. <laughs> Frank goes, it's, it's dry. Why is it dry? Frank would peel, peel his puppet off. He could wring it out. <laughs> but Carol was like, no, I, my, I, my hands never sweat. <laughs> so, but with the, with the symphony concerts, he sweated bullets and um, it was, it was tough, but he, yeah. He did love doing it, but it was a it was a grueling job. I, I think he jokes in his book that that's what turned him gray. <laughs> <laughs> it probably is true. Yeah, it was tough. It really was. Yeah. What a great book too! I really hope yeah. more people oh, pick gosh. that up. And and oh. one thing, and actually, when I was looking back through it as well, I re I realized because obviously I'm driving a lot and, and doing a lot of work since I'm a school teacher during the day, and uh, I was I was disappointed that there's not like an audio book version. I think they really need. They to should come have out. done that. Yeah. 
And yeah. I and I think they should have you read it. I think that would be oh, great. You read it. I would be very happy to read it. Yeah, Anybody so, listening? <laughs> yeah, share share this with Audible, please. <laughs> well, and the interesting thing too is um, when Carol uh, wrote the book, which we did obviously we did that together too, and he he hand wrote. Is that what you're trying to? He did. You know, he he wrote it out longhand m- most of the whole book. Other times I would uh, have a little tape recorder and I'd ask him a question and he'd answer it and then we could transpose it, you know, into the writing. But that book was whittled down into half of the book that Carol wrote. Oh, and I it believe it. Out and it was it, it kind of came out in what they called the 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 Oprah age <laughs> and it was the year of inspiration. So they cut out all the things that had anything that wasn't inspiring or uplifting or anything like that and they took it out and they said we don't want that with this we want this to be the book so i actually have a whole other book that hasn't been printed yet so i want to write a forward and a preface that's preface and a what is it prologue yeah yeah Yeah. so so not just an audiobook we need a second edition yes release the spinning cut it's, it's, it's got all the illustrations that he did and plus it left off in 2004 so I can fill in the gaps since right. then. And I'm just, I just don't know how to go about doing that. So yes. you know, if you have any advice. Oh for my it. gosh. Yeah. <laughs> well, start off with Cam. You're right. Release the spinny cut. Yeah. Start the hashtags. <laughs> get right going here. on Twitter. <laughs> Everyone share, share it, please. Share. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's going to be a, a project I, I'll be happy to work on. And any project that has to do with Carol is what's keeping me going. So that's good. Yeah, no, that's that's amazing, uh, and we're we're been so glad to have you here and and sharing all this. A- Adam, yeah. did you have any other things that you wanted to? Yeah, touch on real I, quick? I've I've got one more kind of question, which kind of ties back into the beginning a little bit, because I know you started off as the secretary, and obviously as your journey with Carol uh, changed your position. Uh, with working with Sesame Street, at some point you probably cl- clearly had to like either resign or, or or stop being the secretary. How long were you still like technically employed? Because I know you said you got those other credits, and, or were some of it like uh, contractor work? I'm just kind of curious as to how yeah. that worked, uh, like on paper throughout this whole uh, career. Right. Um, well, actually, I didn't stay uh, technically with uh, Children's Television Workshop too much longer because um when when carol and i got together and then i was going to move in up here in the country 153 miles away um oh yeah i could no longer work in the workshop so i really had to resign from my job and then basically uh actually what happened was when they threw a big party for me carol drove all the way down and surprised me walked in and i was like oh i was very (laughs) happy and um i had been on a television quiz show meanwhile which they always tease carol that he married me for my prizes um (laughs) (laughs) because i had won uh now you have to picture this i had i didn't have more than ten dollars to my name i mean nothing didn't own a car never had a colored television nothing and i go on this tv quiz show which ctw said yeah go ahead it's just down the block you can you know go take time and go do it and i won i won it took three days to win and i won twice so here I am now, I have my first, I won a car, I won colored television, I won, you know, lots of unbelievable things. And the, the two, I think, best things were a trip to Hawaii, which we took a year later, and a trip, all expenses paid to Switzerland, which we then took right after I resigned from CTW. So that's where we were when they poured the glass of wine, which we could not have afforded, but it was the trip that I won, so they paid for it. So with that glass of wine was the one that I toasted Carol for his persistence. Oh, wow. um, so, yeah. That's uh, right. and so, th- so really, it it was rather quick that I stopped officially working for Sesame Street. Yeah, right. Uh, only because logistics, logistics was you know. Of course, yeah. yeah. And didn't you win that quiz show because you had been reading the Bible on the subway? Well, that's so. <laughs> yes, it's true. <laughs> uh, it was a. Tr- <laughs> it was called Three on a Match, and it was one of these shows where you had to take a written test. Uh, multiple choice, 32 um, questions. You only could get two wrong. Luckily, I only got two wrong. It was like trivia, like, you know, a little bit about everything. And then when you played the game, it was a lot of information. uh, Really, you know, you had to be 
you had to know something to answer the questions. But once you answered the questions, you got these little points and then you could turn over prizes three on a match. If you got three, you matched it. So it was luck and knowledge. Yeah. So, so Bill Cullen was the host and I had been, of course, I was taking the subway every day from Long Island to go to Manhattan for Sesame street. And, and I was on the first stop. So it was packed like wall to wall people. And, um, I must say there were a few times when, you know, you had to look around like, why is this person rubbing up against me kind of thing. And so somebody had said to me, if you read the Bible, they'll stay away from you. And that was true. I got myself my family Bible <laughs> and I read it on the subway every day. I read the Bible and nobody bothered me after that. <laughs> so when my question came up and it was one of the big questions to get the big, you know, points to turn over the prizes, um, the, the questions were, were all about the Bible and I knew every one of them. And Bill Cullen was like, I would not have expected somebody your age to know all these questions about the Bible. And of course I didn't tell him why I was reading the Bible, but um, it was because of that, that I, that I won. <laughs> so. That is <laughs> that is remarkable. Yeah. So serendipitous. I absolutely <laughs> love it. <laughs> Yeah, and there, you know, there is one more thing, came just because you brought up. I wanted sure. to uh, to bring up uh, is is Kermit Love. Did, did how well did you know Kermit Love? Kermit Love, the the man, not the frog. <laughs> yes, um, yes. Ker I knew Ker Kermit extremely well, uh, and a very very you know he, he's quite a character. Uh, he and Carol had a had a wonderful relationship. He of course was magnificently talented in how he built Big Bird and, and just what he could do. Uh, you know, he was incredible and he was very, you know, he was, he was loved by all, but he also could drive you absolutely crazy. And um, I think, you know, unfortunately when Kermit was about to retire, when he was, when he had decided he wanted to retire, he went to Carol and he said, I, um, I think you should retire with me so that, you know, when I go Big Bird, you and in those days they weren't thinking big bird would even live on it would be if carol stopped big bird would stop um but i think you should retire with me carol so big bird you know it'll be we've done it together and carol was like kermit i have no intention of leaving big bird he goes first of all i'm way younger than you <laughs> and i don't want to retire he says but i i'm big bird i don't want big bird to stop you know i'm not going to retire and kermit got very angry with carol actually and he didn't speak to him for quite a while. And Carol was so upset because they had been so close. We traveled everywhere together. Sure. Um, but then uh, years later, uh, they, you know, Carol wrote, I think Carol uh, sent, he sent him a book, The Wisdom of Big Bird, with a picture of drawing in the, in the beginning, in the front, and a, a letter and everything. And then Kermit did get back to Carol and, you know, with his little, he had a way of talking like this. <laughs> that affected British accent. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it was funny. Uh, but mostly, you know, mostly we loved Kermit and he, you know, he, he gave so much to, to Big Bird and to, to the Muppets really in general. But um, ooh, he could he could be a trying person. <laughs> We like we have heard some stories. Oh yeah, <laughs> we sure have. Yeah, and I was wondering yeah. even specifically too of um anything between Carol and and Kermit specifically, especially because um I mean a lot of people ha have very unique stories about Kermit, but just the fact of them like like everything that Kermit built was like I mean it was it was on Carol. Like if there was any conversations about. Um, the puppet itself or just, or even just a f interesting story about the two of them. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Kermit, Kermit, Kermit. Um, wh one of the things, uh, well, Kermit's responsible. <laughs> if you've seen Big Bird the first year, he, Carol always said he looked like he didn't have enough room for a brain in that head. <laughs> so he didn't have hardly any feathers above his eyes. And Carol always thought he was rather ugly actually. Um, uh, but he, so he said to Kermit, you know, I think we need more feathers up top. So then the next time Carol saw uh, Big Bird, he had this huge bouffant, you know, just this like zillion feathers up there. And Carol's like, uh, Kermit, tone it down a little bit. It's got to come Split down a little the difference. Bit. Split the difference. Exactly. <laughs> which which uh, Kermit did. Um, and then one time um, Carol was drew, a, they needed to make a new neck. Uh, for, you know, for, for the bird, that's one of the pieces. And 
Carol drew how he thought it should be made because uh, Kermit came up with a new neck, but he had made it for some reason very thin. So when Carol's putting his head, you know, arm into the neck, and now he's trying to tuck his head into his arm to eliminate the bulge over here, Kermit had made the neck so skinny that it bulged out over Carol's head. And Carol drew a picture and said, you know, I don't know why you changed it, but we can't, that's not good. I can't get rid of my head. And uh, unfortunately, Kermit took great offense at that, you know, telling him how to do that job. And so that was one of the things that kind of started the, the ball rolling for them, you know, for them not getting along. Yeah, well. yeah. and, you know, kind of little things like that. Um, but I mean, he came up with wonderful things. Uh, uh, I'll, I'm going to save, well, he, he did make a, uh, when we did the symphony concerts, um, we needed to be able to have Big Bird out there looking elegant enough to, uh, you know, to be a, be the conductor, which they usually wear tuxedos. So Kermit came up with a wonderful, um, it was supposed to look like a tuxedo shirt, but it was more like a big bib so that we could take the feathers off of Big Bird underneath it. So Carol could at least maybe try to see out. Um, and, and, and in this white bib with black studs, like a tuxedo with a big bow tie, um, and it would, it would attach to the body. So, uh, you know, it was just perfectly placed. Um, that was Kermit's idea. And he put little pin prick holes, little, little dots all through the bib so that even though you really couldn't see out very well, you could see where the lights were, which always meant if you're looking at the lights, you're looking at the audience because the lights are coming at you. Um, and, you know, maybe if you're lucky, you might see that you're not going to fall off the stage. Yeah. But um, that was that was something that Kermit came up with, which worked perfectly for the situation that that was needed because otherwise we used to have a, a boat not a bow tie a regular tie that was made out of kind of weird material but you could see through it slightly but it it kind of buckled if if, if big bird came down a little bit the tie would buckle and it didn't work as well as the the bib the tuxedo plus he needed to be dressy so yeah. um, that was a good one that he did well deb this has been just absolutely amazing to to talk to you um, and as we wrap up, just didn't know if uh, you could share a good puppet tear story with us, <laughs> a moment uh, in in your life where there was something that went wrong in the world of puppetry that you guys wanted to pull your hair out. But now looking back, we could kind of have a good laugh about it. Um, I think I have a well, I, I have a puppet tear story. Um, I mean, there's probably been quite a few, but sure, <laughs> told them to everybody over the years anyway. But this actually ties in with what I was just talking about, which was the the tuxedo bib that Kermit made for uh, conducting the symphony. Um, so one time we were um, out on the road uh, doing a symphony show, and the it, the last number was going to be a, kind of a little bit of a medley, and Big Bird would conduct the orchestra and then kind of put the baton down, step down and do a tiny little, not a real dance, but a little ditty and then find his spot and then just sing the last song to the audience. And of course, Carol had the, the uh, bib on and, um, and in his mind, he knew that, you know, even though you really can't see the audience, if you can see the lights, you know, you're facing them. And I was in the audience this time instead of backstage. So, <laughs> He does his conducting, he steps down, does a little tiny dance, and he, I know now what happened, he looked through the scrim for the lights, and in this particular um, stage, the proscenium had a huge, huge bar of bright, bright lights on either side. So Carol, in his, you know, after his little dance, trying to get his bearings, sees through the scrim of the tuxedo bib, the bright lights says, okay, I'm good, I'm facing the right. And he proceeds to sing his song. Meanwhile, he doesn't realize he's facing the wings, <laughs> singing the song. And I'm in the audience going, oh my God. <laughs> and I wanna go, we're over here, <laughs> we're over here. Oh, but I can't no. see a thing because everybody's just quiet listening to him beautifully sing. And then he finishes the song and he bows. And he, as he bows, the audience starts applauding and yay, Big Bird. And I just know he can hear, wait a second, that sound is coming from over there, not over there. So he gets up, he comes up slowly and he pivots around and faces the audience. And then he bows again 
and very slowly. And he comes up again and then he turns towards the wings and he starts walking off stage. And just before he gets there, he turns to the audience, the head, just the head. And he says, I meant to do that. And he keeps walking. <laughs> He goes backstage. Now I'm in the audience going, oh God, I ran backstage and I thought, I know he's going to be so upset. And indeed he had gotten out of the bird, of course, and he looked so unhappy. He, he thought he just blew the whole thing. But I just, you know, I went over to him and hugged him and I said, they loved it. It was wonderful. Don't worry about a thing. But he, he fretted over that for for days because he said I sang to the wings you know I was like but it's okay it doesn't matter but that that was one of the times when you know it didn't quite go right but it was okay wow it's yeah. oh <laughs> so fun a great story <laughs> for sure yeah and uh, I'm sure people can find more information about Carol at carolspinney.com is there anywhere else you might want to point them to well I know uh we kind of keep a Facebook page you know, Carol Spinney on on Facebook. You can tell I know nothing about all this. I mean, I'm very bad at the uh, technical side of stuff, but I try to put stuff on there. Um, so I, I suppose uh, that through that, uh, if you really uh, in person productions with Tim, the, they're the or our friends who are the agents who uh, you know take care of stuff for us. So a lot of times he'll send me things that people sent to him, and then they'll send it to me, and I'll answer it. So I suppose through uh, Tim Bendig at in-person productions or um, mostly just Carol Spinney, Facebook yeah. or dot com, I suppose. And, and and how do people, how do producers contact you to get the spinny cut of the book? <laughs> <laughs> What's the best way for them to get in contact with well, you? <laughs> Release the spinny cut. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my email. <laughs> give my email. Right. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll email us. Here's I was going to say, we'll be the middleman. <laughs> That's right. Oh All right. Well, yeah. Debbie Spinney, thank you so much for for joining us on Puppeteers. It's been such a pleasure uh, to get to talk to you. And yeah, this is a dream. Thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> I, I love doing it. <laughs> thank Thanks you so, so much. much. Bye. Okay. Bye. We're at the end of another episode of Puppeteers, but the fun doesn't stop here. Visit Puppeteers.com for show notes and links to projects mentioned in this episode. Make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at PuppeteersPod, where we're posting new things every day. Puppeteers is edited by Matt Bowen and made possible thanks to viewers like you. If you enjoy this content, you can join our incredible Patreon patrons who are supporting the show for as little as $1 per episode. Those folks get access to early releases, uncut episodes, official Cup O tiers just like we use on the show, and could even submit interview questions for our guests. Go to patreon.com slash puppeteerspod to learn more. Another great way to support Puppeteers is rating and reviewing us on iTunes, leaving a comment or subscribing to this channel, or tell a friend about your favorite episode. Thanks again for joining us on Puppeteers Puppetry Shop Talk, in-depth interviews with the world's most passionate puppeteers. Hosted by me, Adam Krutinger. And me, Cameron Garrity. You said that this was going to be shown on Carol's birthday. Yes. Yep. Yes. Uh, yeah. Again, selfishly, uh, Big, Big Bird has always been my my absolute favorite character, and I, I'll never forget yeah. when I first read uh, the Wizard of Big Bird and found out that we had the same birthday. I had yeah. lost my That's little cool. mind. So, <laughs> <laughs> and he never found it. Carol. No, <laughs> he's a Christmas Carol.